Hi everyone, um, I'm Steve Donnellan. I'm the Head of Research here at the South Australian Museum and I'd like to welcome you to this Sprig Lecture. I'd also like to start out by acknowledging the Kaurna people, the traditional owners and custodians of this land, and I respect their spiritual relationship with the country that has developed over thousands of years. Their cultural heritage and beliefs are dynamic and remain important to the Kaurna people today. I'd also like to mention a little bit about um, Dr. Reg Sprig, whom the lecture series is named after. He's a very, uh, a very influential South Australian in the mining and, um, and scientific area. And one of the things that he's really famous for is discovering Ediacaran fossils up in the Flinders Ranges in 1946. Ediacaran fossils are the earliest complex animal fossils found on the planet around, and they were alive around 560 million years ago. These fossils remain a really important part of the museum's collections and its um, ongoing research activity. I'd like to um, introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Andy Austin from the University of Adelaide. Andy's an entomologist and evolutionary biologist and has spent most of his uh, research career working on really interesting groups of insects and other, other arthropods. And the two main areas of research that Andy has concentrated on are the wasps, which we'll talk about tonight, and these groups of strange underground animals that live in subterranean waters through much of Australia. Andy is one of the foundational members of the Society of Australian Systematic Biologists, um, which started back in the late 1990s and brings together the scientific interests of the Australian systematic um, community. And systematics is a scientific discipline that, that has importance today and a growing importance as we seek to document the um, faunal and floral diversity of the planet, much of it endangered, in fact, in, in danger of not even being known before it disappears. So this sort of foundational work in biology is also part of the language that scientists use to talk about organisms. Without that, we wouldn't be able to talk to each other or the general public or transmit important ideas about conservation. So Andy has been uh, at the University of Adelaide for the latter part of his career, but he started off at the University of Sydney did his PhD here in Adelaide and then went to the Natural History M Museum in London and came back to Adelaide where he's been ever since and has now become a professor in uh, evolutionary biology at the university. He also has a strong association with the South Australian Museum and has a very large insect collection that hopefully one day he'll um, um, donate, at least in part, to the museum. And tonight, Andy's going to talk about one of the loves of his life, his research loves, which is the, uh, the wasp, a really important group of animals that you'll, um, and you'll see why they're important for many different aspects. So um, for tonight's fireside chat, I'd like to introduce Professor Andy Austin. Thanks, Steve. Um, so as Steve has said, I'm, my main research interests uh, surround looking at parasitic insects and particularly parasitic wasps. And so what I want to talk to you about tonight is really sort of some of the fascinating biological aspects of this group of organisms and why they're so important in the environment and how they're utilized um, by humans. And so this is a group of organisms which in many ways dominate lots of, of habitats and environments, but most people are completely unfamiliar with them because the vast majority of them are tiny in size. So tonight, Andy, you're going to talk about parasitoids. So I think pretty much everybody has heard what a parasite is, but what's a, what's a parasitoid? These two terms obviously are quite similar, but they describe really quite different sorts of biologies um, for insects and other arthropods. So <clears throat> parasites are organisms that live on a, a host and inevitably they don't kill it. They need their host as a food source and a, as a place to live but they're completely dependent on it. So their survival is dependent on the survival of their host. And so, you know, a good example is a, is, um, a species of lice that lives on the surface of, uh, of sheep or ticks that uh, might be on native animals like marsupials or on your you know, pet dog or cat. Parasitoids, on the other hand, are really best considered to be um, highly specialised predators because what they do is the adult wasps lay their eggs either inside or on the surface of a host and the larvae of the developing wasp use it as a food source but they inevitably kill it before the host has a chance to uh, turn into an adult and reproduce itself. So what um, is shown on this, um, this first slide here is um, the major groups of, of Hymenoptera, 
um, this major order of insects. And so the, the sort of the primitive um, hymenopterans are referred to as sawflies. And the top two images here are showing sawflies, um, which uh, their main biology is that they feed on plants or wood as larvae. And, and then um, they belong to a, a particular group of, um, of hymenoptera. Um, which turn out to be not very well represented in the Australian fauna. They're mostly a northern hemisphere group. Um, the main group of Hymenoptera referred to the Apocrita, and it includes many of the groups of insects that you would be familiar with, ants and bees, so the, the social insects. But these um, images down the bottom show three examples of parasitic wasps, and they vary in size from wasps that are almost the size of your hand through to some of the tiniest insects that have been um, recorded on the planet. And, and this, um, these two here are tiny little wasps which are less than half a millimetre in size. And they're actually getting down to the theoretical smallest size that you can be and still have all of the machinery that you need to have a, a brain, have muscles that work your legs and wings and have a reproductive system. In describing the sort of the life history of, um, of parasitic wasps, there are two sort of um, strategies that they use to parasitize their host. So in this image up the top, what's happened is the adult wasp has laid its eggs onto the surface of a caterpillar. And then the, once the parasitoid eggs hatch into a larva, they simply use their mandibles to pierce the surface of the caterpillar and then they suck tissue through the hole, grow into um, sort of large grubs before they pupate and turn into adults. And in that process, they end up killing the host. There's another example here, which is of a, a parasitic wasp larva that's feeding on a, um, on a spider. So these are referred to as ectoparasitoids, ex external um, parasitoids, if you like. The other group are referred to as endoparasitoids. And these are parasitoids that lay their eggs into the inside tissues of a host. And then the parasitoid larva feeds on the, in, the internal tissues, um, eventually killing the host. And so the hosts can be the egg stage of a host. And this is a spider egg sac. Um, and some of those eggs, the ones that are sort of brown in color, have been parasitized by tiny little wasps. Or in the case on the, on the far side there, this is a caterpillar which is full of developing parasitoids. And then what happens once they've finished feeding on the host and they're going to spin a pupil cocoon, they burst out of the host um, and end up killing it. Um, and so the biology of endoparasitoids is fundamentally not much different from the alien in the alien series of movies. And we, we live on a planet which literally has probably tens of thousands of minute little aliens in that respect. And so what we know about the evolution um, of parasitoids is that inferred from, you know, a, a knowledge of their phylogeny, their evolutionary relationships, is that um, ectoparasitoids evolved from ancestors which were probably wood boring and that the most sophisticated forms of, um, of parasitism, the endoparasitoids, have actually evolved from ectoparasitic ancestors. So, the, evolution, the evolutionary transitions went from wood feeding to ectoparasitism to being endoparasitic. So these are the really sophisticated guys. The other thing that um, is kind of fascinating in this respect is the wasps, including bees and ants that have become plant feeding or phytophagous, have actually evolved from parasitic ancestors, which is uh, you know, something that most people don't appreciate. Here we have a, um, a, a diorama showing lots of uh, examples of what are moth and butterfly caterpillars. And all of these have been parasitized by parasitic wasps and what you see on the surface of them are the parasitoids that have actually burst out of the body and have ended up killing the host. And so caterpillars are one group of insects that are parasitized by um, by parasitic wasps, but pretty much every group of insects and many groups of other arthropod, terrestrial arthropods are parasitized by parasitic wasps. 
beetles, crickets and grasshoppers, um, bugs, flies, um, and so on. So Andy, you mentioned beetles. So beetle taxonomists are very proud of the idea that beetles are the biggest group of, the most speciose group of insects on the planet. But if wasps are parasitizing beetles, doesn't that mean that they would actually be the, the most diverse group of insects on the, or oh, animals on the planet for that matter? You're completely right, Steve. Um, the, the difference between the <clears throat> research that's been t undertaken on beetles versus hymenopterans is there's a long history that goes back to the 1800s of amateur beetle taxonomists describing species. And so there's this, this history of studies on beetles and describing species where for parasitic wasps, the vast majority of species are minuscule and tiny and require really quite um, you know, technical methods for studying them, such as under the scanning electron microscope, they need to be slide mounted to, to be examined just to see the characters that you would use to um, identify and describe them. But the story is a bit more complex than that. So um, one of the things that um, is now being documented for parasitic wasps, and this goes back um, about 20 years or so ago now, is that when this is a, an image of a little parasitic wasp and it's laying its eggs inside the host um, caterpillar here, and this is a group of parasitoids, uh, the family name are Reconidae. So many of these are endoparasitic on um, Lepidopteran or uh, caterpillar larvae. Um, one of the things that we now know for most parasitic wasps is that they're highly host specific. That is that a single species of wasp only parasitizes a single host species. And so if parasitic wasps are parasitizing um, large numbers of beetles, as well as all of the other groups of insects, then you don't really need to do the maths to do the calculation that there are far more parasitic wasps than there are beetles, and which means that they turn out to be the largest order of animals on the planet. In conjunction with that, or in addition to it, not only are parasitic wasps parasitizing um, cap the caterpillar stage, there are also other species of parasitic wasps are parasitizing the other life history stages of the same species of host. So there was an image just before of, uh, of the eggs of spiders. So for this particular species of moth, there would be a species of parasitic wasp that parasitizes the eggs. This is the little bacronid that parasitizes the larval stage. And then there are other species that parasitize the pupil and more rarely the adult stage. On top of that, there are also some specialized parasitoids called hyperparasitoids. And what they do is they specialize in parasitizing parasitic wasps. So this species of Braconid, which is developing inside the host, um, the hyperparasitoids go looking for hosts and they only lay eggs in it if it's already parasitized and they feed on the parasitoid. So there's this incredible network um, of species of parasitoids associated with just a single host species. So you multiply that all up, you know, for the vast number of available hosts and you come to the realization that there are vast numbers of parasitic wasps. So what, what were beetle taxonomists thinking? <laughs> well, you know, it's, um, at the time um, when people were calculating the number of known species, it was simply based on really the morphological description of species. And there are far more species that are formally described of beetles still than there are of Wasp. parasitic wasps. Okay. Um, there's an interesting um, sort of issue about particularly endoparasitoids. So this applies to only parasitoids that are developing inside, of, inside their host, not ectoparasitoids that are feeding externally. And that is that um, all insects have an immune system. It's not the antigen-based anti, uh, um, antigen, um, immune system that vertebrates, including mammals, have. It's a cellular immune system, but they have a system for detecting and dealing with foreign bodies which invade their, um, the inside body cavity. 
And so if an endoparasitoid um, parasitizes a particular host, the host will mount a defensive mechanism against it where it mobilizes cells inside the body cavity to surround and try and digest or kill um, the internal um, entity. Often it's bacteria, it might be fungal hyphae, or it might be an endoparasitoid. And so there is this, um, what's happened is that uh, hymenopteran parasitoids have countered those um, defensive mechanisms by mobilizing a whole range of really sophisticated um, adaptations for dealing with and overcoming the host's defenses. And so when the parasitoid um, injects its eggs into the host, it might inject um, a, um, a venom, which is just a complex cocktail of chemicals to overcome the cellular immune system. But these guys, this group of braconid wasps, mobilize a special group of viruses which they've harnessed mutualistically and what they do is they inject this virus into the host and the virus neutralizes the immune system. And so in this diagram, it's a little bit complex, but let me take you through it. So here's that wasp that was parasitizing a caterpillar and in its ovaries where the parasitoid eggs are, there's a special section of the ovaries called the calyx region and that region um, is specialized into manufacturing and packaging this special group of viruses. So this group of viruses, they're called poly-DNA viruses or polydenoviruses for, for short. And they're called poly-DNA viruses for, because the DNA is, is um, packaged into multiple circlets. That kind of doesn't matter to the story. But the virus is packaged um, in the um, the calyx region of the, um, of the ovaries of the wasp. And then when the wasp oviposits into a caterpillar, it's injecting its eggs into it, but it's also injecting virus particles. And so these virus particles then um, permeate through the body cavity um, of the host, neutralizing the cellular immune system and allowing the parasitoid to develop successfully um, and then emerge bursts out of the host, killing it, and then pupates and turns into another wasp. This is the only case that's known um, in life on Earth where a virus replicates in one species, but its mode of action is in fact in another species. So, and what we know is that there is a huge radiation of, um, of this mutualistic sort of arrangement in this particular group of braconids and it turns out that um, the virus that's in a particular species of wasp only works on its host, it doesn't work on other hosts. And so part of the story of why these wasps are so host specific is because they have evolved this sophisticated machinery to deal with the immune system of their particular host. Which I guess brings up the idea of an arms race really, doesn't it? You've got the host, the parasite, there's a secret agent that the um, parasite's using to interfere with the host. And I guess eventually the host will evolve some sort of adaptation to deal with the virus. And it's probably been going on for tens uh, of millions of years. In fact, we know from um, DNA phylogenetic studies that this um, relationship between this special group of viruses and these wasps go back to about 90 million years ago. So this is not something new in the evolution of parasitic wasps. And there's clearly been this to and fro arms race between hosts developing strategies to reduce parasitism and strategies by the wasp to overcome, uh, to overcome those strategies. And it's going on all around us. It's the ultimate home delivery pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, I did want to touch on something else while we're um, on it, and that is just going back to this issue of being highly host-specific. So not all parasitic wasps have viruses. Um, it's only this group of braconids. Other parasitic wasps use venoms and other strategies to overcome their host's immune system. But it's this biological trait of being host-specific which lends parasitic wasps 
to being the ideal biological control agent. So if you imagine a caterpillar or a beetle that's actually accidentally been introduced into Australia and it becomes a pest um, on corn crops or um, a pest on um, pine radiata um, um, forests, um, it might be a scale insect on, on oranges, um, you can then mount um, a biological control program by searching for the parasitoids that parasitize that particular host where it's originally come from, introduce them, and they will multiply up, killing their particular host and then reducing the numbers of the pest. And because they're host specific, we know that they're not gonna transfer onto any of the native insects that um, they might otherwise. So Andy, you mentioned that a lot of these wasps are so tiny that we're only becoming aware of them. This must produce some quite difficult technical issues for studying them. Um, I presume you're, you've mastered a number of different approaches for dealing with this? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the techniques that we use um, now and have for probably about the last 10 years is using DNA sequence data to characterize species. And, you know, this, you know, this is often referred to as DNA barcoding for want of a better term, but we now use sequence data from multiple genes to characterize particular species. And um, one of the things that we find, you can, you can make some headway with morphology. And there's some examples here um, of, uh, again, these are tiny wasps. Um, they've evolved to become wingless. So these are female wasps. They don't have wings. Um, primarily because their hosts are found in leaf litter and these wasps are simply crawling around inside leaf litter looking for um, the hosts that um, have been deposited. These are endoparasitoids of, of the egg stage of their host. They don't look like wasps at all. They look like kind of modified fleas. And they're also minuscule in size. These are insects that are about 0.6 of a millimetre long. So these two wasps kind of look quite similar to each other turns out that they're actually in completely different families. So one of the problems in studying these wasps morphologically, it's kind of interesting from an evolutionary point of view, but they have become morphologically more simplified. And so you, you find that unrelated groups end up looking like each other simply because they've reduced characters in the same sort of way in, a, in so what we often refer to as sort of convergent evolution. But these are uh, tiny wasps, uh, minuscule in fact, and so they have become morphologically specialised, but morphologically specialised in a convergent way. So their sort of morphology doesn't really help us with their taxonomy that much. But so those photos were taken with um, scanning electron microscopes. Yeah. So these are scanning electron micrographs. This is a this is an image of a slightly bigger wasp. It's about a millimetre in length. Um, where we're using sort of just, um, you know, a camera mounted on a, a high magnification sort of light microscope. Um, and there are some really neat tools now in terms of digital imaging that you can use to um, image um, these insects for, for morphological studies. Um, but a good example of a character that's highly convergent, this is a group of wasps that parasitize um, the egg stage of their host again, so they're all tiny. They're only, these are, these are big wasps. They're in around the sort of one and a half millimeter length, okay. And they have this bizarre structure. So this is the thorax and this is the abdomen. And they have this horn-like structure which grows out from the first segment of the abdomen. And so one of the things that, you know, one of the first questions we asked about this, well, well what's the function of this horn? And so wasps use a specialized structure called the ovipositor to lay their eggs into a host and they hold it internally in the body. And when they lay eggs, they sort of push it out through the, the back of the abdomen. And so this turns out to be an adaptation to increase the length of the ovipositor without increasing the overall length of the body. Like a double garage. It is. <laughs> uh, well, a double garage where your cars are sort of lined up with each other. <laughs> so in these wasps, the ovipositor sits internally inside the body and it goes right up into this horn. And when they use it, they sort of slide it out under muscular control. So and this turns out to be a really neat 
taxonomic character for species identification. So in some groups, morphology can help a lot. So that's only in the females, though? This is only in the yeah. females. The males of these wasps look identical to each other. You can't tell them apart at That's all. tough. Yeah. So the taxonomy is based on the, on the female sex. Yeah. The other thing that we know about the evolution of, of parasitic wasps is once they evolve to parasitize a particular host group, and this is a, a group of um, parasitoids that parasitize the eggs of um, initially of um, pentatomid bugs, what happens rarely is that they probably accidentally parasitize the eggs of a different host group. And if successful, they can radiate onto that host group. And so part of the explanation about why these parasitic wasps have been able to exploit lots of different groups of insects as hosts is that there have been these rare switching events where they accidentally parasitize another host and then they radiate into it. And so we know from the sort of evolutionary relationships of this group is that the ground plan or the most primitive hosts, host group were pentatomid bugs um, and that they switched to parasitizing the eggs of caterpillars of moths. And they've also switched from lepidopteran eggs to both fly eggs and also to lacewing eggs. And so this is part of the explanation about why they parasitize so many groups. Andy, do you think the, the notion that the early, early parasitoids hit up the eggs might be the way then you can get into a new group without having to account to encounter all the sophisticated immune system of the adult and the larva? So once you're in there, then that coevolution can kick off and then you can then start to deal with all the other issues of parasitizing larvae and pupae and adults. You've just articulated a hypothesis that we're actually testing for multiple groups now. And what it requires is a really detailed, um, robust set of evolutionary relationships at the base of the phylogeny for these groups. And for at least two groups, it turns out that egg parasitism is found in the basal groups in the phylogeny. At the beginning. And, at the beginning. And then higher up the phylogeny, they're parasitizing beetle larvae and so on and so forth. So there is some evidence for that. Yeah. And you're right. Eggs don't have an immune, immune system. Okay. Um, it's only the sort of it's, it kicks off in the first larval instars. So this... I guess brings us to what we might know about the fauna of parasitic wasps for Australia and for the world. And so in this pie diagram, there's about 15,000 species of, of hymenopterans are known for Australia and about two thirds of those are parasitic species. Of 15,000 described species, we estimate that that's about five to 10% of the true number of species. And there are, some, there are some reasons for that. Okay. But the other thing we know about the Australian fauna is that it actually is, well, it differs. I was going to say biased, but I mean, being biased sort of indicates a direction, but I, I don't think that's the case. The makeup of the Australian parasitoid fauna is different from that which is for the whole world. So this pie diagram here is for the 15,000 described species. Um, of Australian wasps. And these here are the parasitic groups. Um, these are the bees and the ants. One of the things we know about those two groups is probably about 50% of all species of ants and bees are, are known, they're formally described, where for the parasitoid groups, we're talking about five to 10% are actually formally described. This is what it looks like for the world. There's about 180,000 described species on a global basis. And one of the things we see is that these two groups, a group referred to as the Chalcidoidea and a group referred to as the Echimonids, um, are disproportionately different in size compared to what we know about the rest of the world. So there's something about Chalcidoids which, uh, where they've, they've done extremely well in Australia and um, we don't actually know the answer to that. And it's something that really detailed, 
taxonomic and evolutionary studies are required to get a handle on it. Um, and this is what chalcidoids look like. They, uh, you know, again, these are insects that, so the smallest known insect is a chalcidoid wasp, which is 0.15 of a millimetre in length. And chalcidoids also can be quite large. They get up to 20 millimetres. And there is this plethora of morphological forms um, that pervade um, this super family of wasps. And if you can think of a parasitic biology, they pretty much do it. And they have um, also, um, some of them have become specialised plant feeders. They um, have seed feeding larvae, and it's kind of, it's kind of like advanced sort of plant feeding because they don't feed on the leaves. They feed on the seeds and they, f they treat the seed like a host and actually kind of parasitize it. Um, and one group, um, which are um, incredibly bizarre looking wasps, which are these, are uh, the famous pollinating agents of figs and have this mutualistic relationship with figs. And how, how big are they? Uh, they're in the sort of millimeter size. Okay, yeah. so they'd be hard to see on a fig. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're more likely to, well, you don't see the adults because they're not around very much. They emerge from the, from the, the pore at the, the, bottom, at of the, the bottom of the fig, and then they disperse looking for, you know, to then find, find other figs. And so you're more likely to see tiny little larvae you know, inside the fig when you pull it open. Um, so and it's, there's, it's extra protein. It is, yeah. And you, would, you wouldn't even notice that you were, yeah. you were eating it. Um, but um, I think most the commercial varieties of figs um, have mostly been introduced into Australia. I don't know that we even have their their pollinators because they're they're not grown in that way. But the native figs certainly have large numbers of of pollinators of figs. So we were talking, Steve, about why there were so many wasps and some of the taxonomic problems associated with them. And one of the things that um, has been revealed through modern, um, in particular, DNA studies is that there's a very, very high level of cryptic speciation in these groups. So cryptic speciation is where you have different species which um, are morphologically indistinguishable from each other, but they're true, truly different biological species. So for parasitic wasps, um, we know that they're biologically different because they parasitize different hosts and that's the only host that they parasitize. And when you look into um, the basis of that, um, there's a whole science that, um, um, that people have been working at for the last two or three decades, um, trying to work out how parasitic wasps locate their hosts in the environment. So if you, if you are, you know, one or one and a half millimetres in size and you parasitise a tiny little caterpillar in this, you know, this vast habitat, you know, you, you're not going to find your host if you're searching randomly. It's, you know, it would be impossible. And so one of the things that we find on all insects, but in particular parasitic wasps in regard to how they find their hosts, is on the antennae of the hosts and the antennae on female wasps are always incredibly long. They bristle with a, um, an array of somewhere between 20 and 30 different sensory structures. And those sensory structures are specific to detecting particular sorts of chemicals. And so for, as an example, when a caterpillar feeds, for example, on a eucalypt leaf, there are volatiles that are released by the eucalypt leaf. And there are sensory structures on the antennae of, of wasps that will pick up the, detect those volatiles. And so they hone in on the chemistry of the volatiles that have been released from the feeding caterpillar. So when they then alight, when they then land on the leaf, which has been damaged, they then start searching for signs of their particular species of caterpillar and the chemicals in the saliva of the caterpillar, um, their frass, their droppings, um, are all emitting particular sorts of chemicals. And so what happens is that um, in terms of searching for their hosts, these wasps are actually working down 
a cascade of stimuli, once each stimulus has been satisfied, it reduces the area that they need to search in to optimize finding their host. So it goes from, you know, testing the whole environment um, to find if there is volatiles associated with damage caused by a particular host down to finding <coughs> that particular um, plant to then finding damage caused by their host. So each time that happens, the volume of space that they need to search in is reduced by an order of magnitude or more, which then increases the chances of them finding a host. It's, it's an extraordinary system, isn't it? Yeah. When you've got a minute brain to process all that information. Yeah. I mean, compared well, to a dog that's got this amazing sense of smell, it's also got a massive brain to help it process exactly. the information. Yeah. And, and yet, clearly, the brain in terms of, particularly when we're talking about vertebrates, is, is minuscule. Um, but it still has the sensory machinery to process all of that information. This is an example of uh, work that was done overseas and we've kind of duplicated this to some degree for Australian parasitic wasps. So each of these lines of photographs um, are a particular species of wasp and morphologically um, these were all thought to be the same species. So morphology told us that these were identical to each other and that the rows were different from each other. So here we have five species of morphological species um, and we have three um, individuals that were thought to be the same species. When uh, people were undertaking field work and were rearing these wasps um, from caterpillars, they found that these wasps were coming from different host caterpillars. So the, f the first thing that you would, you know, alarm bells ring, if they're coming from different hosts, then they're likely to be different species. And so what this work um, did, it took those initial observations of that this is one species, but it's coming from different hosts, and then looked at the DNA of those wasps, and it turns out that, so this is a phylogeny based on the DNA sequence data, it turned out that the DNA profile for those species was showing that there were actually three different species, each one being specific to a particular host. So in this whole study of parasitoids that um, were attacking caterpillars, and this was work that was done in Central America. So provisionally, morphology told us that there are 171 species. The DNA barcoding found an additional 142 species. So this is one of these groups where there is really rampant cryptic speciation um, and it's part of the reason why it's only very recent studies that are starting to show that there are massive numbers of species of parasitic wasps, far more than any other group of insects or organisms on the planet. So prior to the introduction of these sort of DNA sequencing technologies, you really would have had to have caught the, the wasp and its host together yeah. to get that information. Now yeah. you can do it independently of, of that relationship. You can. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that we tend to do now for taxonomic studies is because there are such vast numbers of species, describing large numbers of species simply based on their DNA profile it is kind of intellectually inert. We know that how many species there are and that's the sort of, you know, the number that's important. So when we describe new species formally, we tend to do it just for species that have been reared from a known host. And then we have that biological information that we can link to the DNA profile of that particular species. So Andy, do you sometimes bring the host back and then wait for the adults to emerge? We do. Or, that's, sorry, the pupae to emerge? That's, that's a lot of what we do. So field work um, is very much collecting the host, not collecting the wasps, bringing them back to the laboratory, setting them up um, so that they're feeding on their, their plant you know, and, and then waiting for the wasps to emerge. And what proportion of hosts turn out to be infected with parasitoids? Yeah, look, good question, because there's not a simple answer to that. Um, it varies between time of the year. It, oh. it varies between location. But for 
if you averaged all of those things out, something like um, between 30 and about 50% of, for example, caterpillars as a host group are parasitized by wasps. It's remarkable they're still on the planet. <laughs> well, yeah, but they're also, you know, these are highly fecund phytophix insects. They're producing, you know, butterflies and moths produce huge numbers of eggs, huge numbers of larvae, but there's no doubt that parasitic wasps are helping to regulate those population numbers from season to season and location to location. And it's one of the things that's linked to why they're so successful biological control yeah. agents. So in terms of cryptic species, um, these are three groups of, um, of wasps um, in the families Braconidae within the Chalcidoidea and a family referred to as Platygastridae. Um, these are groups of parasitic wasps where um, cryptic speciation is unbelievably rampant to the point where um, species that were thought to be um, a single morphological species have turned out to be between 15 and 40 biological species. So to give you this image here um, is a nice one to give you an idea of the size of some of these species. So this is a, this is a moth egg and this is the size of the, of the parasitic wasp. And there are about 30 species that look exactly identical to this, all searching and, and parasitizing different host species. The other thing about the Australian fauna that's worth knowing, we, many of these groups of parasitoids I've been talking about are found everywhere across the planet. But Australia turns out to have um, some of the old archaic groups of parasitoids and there are four families in Australasia because one of them's found in New Zealand and these are really quite primitive parasitoids um, some of them are known from the fossil record and they go back 50 to 60 million years and probably further. Um, and so um, not only are parasitic wasps fundamentally interesting in terms of studying them in Australia for their biology, but also from an, from an evolutionary point of view, um, you know, these are, these are really critical groups to include in, in phylogenies if you can find them. So Andy, you've been telling us about the very high proportion of species that are undescribed. Do you think we'll ever ever know with any sort of precision how many species of wasps there are? Well, the answer to that theoretically is yes, practically. But from a practical point of view, um, I have some significant doubts about it. So one of the things that colleagues of mine who work on parasitic wasps um, undertaking really detailed um, studies collecting them in the field in different places around the world and using um, DNA barcoding to determine the number of species, what they've done over um, a period of time is trying to work out how many species of a particular group or all parasitoids are found at a single point location. And the evidence is that even from detailed long-term studies, we still don't seem to ever capture anything like the true number of parasitoids. So as an example, this is a study done by colleagues um, in Papua New Guinea, um, and it was based on um, 1800 um, DNA sequences from 1800 individuals. And it, the data indicated that there were more than 400 species there. And so these graphs are the number of species that, a number of individuals that are sampled um, and the number of species. And so the accumulation curve for this study in Papua New Guinea shows that there's no indication that they're getting anywhere close to the true number of, of species that are present at this location. And that's, that's because the curve's still going up. Because the curve's still going it, up. It hasn't flattened out. Yeah. You go out into the field and you sample some more and all you're going to do is add more individuals to the top of that curve. Um, a similar study in Thailand um, on parasitic wasps for a particular group of wasps, which these are the, the microgastrines, which are the one that have the symbiotic virus and parasitized caterpillars. Same story. And even it's not a, it's not a, um, a phenomenon that's, that's specific to tropical habitats. This is data for Sweden 
um, for the same group of organisms. And the fauna of the insect fauna for Sweden is incredibly well known, but for parasitic wasps, they're still showing the same trend. And the real, the real clincher for this is a study that has been going on in Costa Rica for 30 years. And it's a very detailed study where um, they have field workers that go out and collect all groups of insects. They bring them back to a tropical laboratory and they rear parasitoids out. So this is an accumulation curve um, for 30 years worth of field-based research. And you can see that curve is still not um, reaching a plateau in any way at all. So bottom line is, is there are astronomical numbers of species there and it doesn't kind of matter how much work and effort you bring to bear. All you're doing is you're just finding more and more species every time you go out. So how do you think that would affect um, perspectives on conservation? I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a major sort of conservation issue here. We're talking about vast numbers of species that are associated with particular host species at a particular point location. And the only way that you can conserve these species because they're intimately involved in um, the biology of their host is, is to preserve habitat, not preserve species. It's the only way that you can do it. And, and do you think you might use some sort of monitoring of species numbers in groups like parasitoids because they're found around the world, they're obviously yeah. very abundant and they're yeah. relatively easy to sample as a tool for monitoring conservation success? You can, well, yeah, potentially, but what you can do is you, be, um, because you know particular groups of parasitoids have radiated in particular host groups, if you, if you end up um, sampling, you know, parasitoids across the board and you identify them down to major families and then DNA barcode them, you can say, well, that family or that subfamily, they're caterpillar parasitoids. These are beetle parasitoids. Because most of them are host-specific, it gives you a handle on how many species yeah. of caterpillars there are, how yeah. many species of beetles and so on. Yeah. So, so you can certainly do that. So it'd be a very complex index. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, I think that brings us to the end. Um, what's been a fabulous fireside chat. <laughs> without uh, fire. Without fire yeah. and without wasps. Um, it certainly stimulated my, um, my curiosity about a group of insects that I really knew close to nothing about, except for those that are parasitizing my lemon tree at the moment, the gall wasps. Um, so I'd like to thank um, Andy on behalf of the, um, the virtual audience for a fantastic um, talk and a fabulous insight to a group of insects that are clearly very important to us and the planet and for um, our economic and our, um, and our natural sort of values. Thanks, Andy. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much.